In this two-part video, we'll solve an ODE related to the temperature of an object. In the last video, we drew the face portrait and anticipated solution. We'll use them to confirm our numerical answer we'll obtain shortly. We have this first-order linear ODE, which we'd like to solve via the ODE45 function in MATLAB. We'll be performing three parameter studies, so we should make our own user-defined function which solves this ODE. Let's jump into MATLAB to do this. Here we are in MATLAB. I typed out a few parameters ahead of time. The problem says we need to carry out the integration long enough such that we can see the temperature stabilize on the plot. It doesn't explicitly tell us how long of a time span this requires, but I found that simulating for 4000 seconds does the job pretty well. I found this purely from experimentation and had to try about 5 different Tmax values before I settled on 4000. Let's scroll down to the end of the script to write the custom function which solves the ODE. Here I wrote out the function header. It's called LTM for lump thermal mass. It takes a lot of inputs and returns one output, T. One of the inputs is the option variable, which we'll use to change the accuracy of the ODE45 function. This isn't necessary in some parts of the problem, so we'll make options an empty variable when we don't have to fiddle with the ODE45 tolerance. I made the dt dt anonymous function and passed it into the ODE45 function. We ignore the first output of ODE45 because it will be identical to the t vector passed into the LTM function. This means that the t vector must be at least three elements. If you make t a two element vector, MATLAB will automatically choose the step size of the time vector and it will not be the same size as the t vector. This will mess up the plotting we do later in the problem, so make sure the time vector contains all of the points at which you want to integrate, not a vector of just the start and end times. Let's go back to the main part of the script. The objective of part D, the first parameter study, is to see how the temperature varies as we vary the heat transfer coefficient h. The best way to solve this is to use a for loop to iterate through each of the different h values we study. For this part, there is no external heat generation, so g of t equals 0. I'll code this in along with a few other parameters. I made the g variable an anonymous function because it's technically a function of time. This construction allows us to easily modify g later on. The h data vector holds the four different heat transfer coefficients we'll study. The options variable is empty for now because we don't need to enhance ODE45's accuracy. The th matrix stores the temperature response corresponding to each h value in each row. Within the for loop, we call the LTM function with the specific value of h data we want. The plot illustrates the effect of changing the heat transfer coefficient. The first curve up here is pretty interesting. If there's no heat transfer coefficient, there's no, well, heat transfer between the mass and air. There's also no external heat source since g of t equals zero, so the temperature remains constant at 400 Celsius. I hope this agrees with common sense. The other three curves exhibit much more interesting behavior. In the last video, we said increasing h will decrease the steady state temperature but that's only true if g of t is non-zero. Since g of t equals zero, the steady state temperature of all three curves will all be t infinity. However, we can see that increasing the heat transfer coefficient increases the rate at which heat is transferred, 
The purple curve reaches TSS well before the red curve because a higher heat transfer coefficient means that more heat can be transferred faster. You've probably experienced this in real life. Let's say you walk outside in the winter when it's freezing. You'll probably get cold pretty fast, but your body temperature will drop even faster if it's windy because the wind induces a larger heat transfer coefficient and thus heat is transferred away from your body more rapidly. We just explored what happens when we change the heat transfer coefficient while holding g of t equals zero. Now let's see what happens when we say h is constant and g of t is some constant non-zero value. We should expect the steady state temperature to increase with increasing g of t. Like the last part, we'll use a for loop to obtain the temperature response for each individual value of g of t. The G data variable stores each G value, and the T G matrix stores the temperatures corresponding to each G value in each row. Within the for loop, we redefine the G anonymous function as the current value of G data. We then pass G into the LTM function. The first thing we should notice is that all four curves start at the initial temperature, 400 C. This is a good start. The shape of each curve resembles the figure 1 curves, as well as our anticipated solution we drew in the first video. Just as we predicted, a strong external heat source will increase the steady state temperature. The last part of the problem is where things get interesting. This time, we need to explore what happens to the mass's temperature if we make g of t a pulsed heat source instead of just a constant value. In this part, g of t is some value up until a certain time dt, after which g of t equals zero. We can represent this using the heavy side step function. The value g of t takes on and the time at which g of t switches to zero will be studied. In this part, we change the initial temperature from 400 C to T infinity. Our heat source strength is GC. GC will be slightly modified by the delta T values. This time, I chose to make the end time 1500 seconds instead of 4000. Hopefully you understand what the TD matrix represents by now. Finally, I redefined the options variable using the ODE set function to impose a more stringent error tolerance on ODE 45. We need this because of the discontinuity stemming from the heavy side function. Now we can write the for loop. Within the loop, we need to define g of t as an anonymous function, then pass it into the LTM function. I'm also going to make a figure consisting of two subplots. The upper subplot will plot g of t so we can see what the pulsed heat source looks like. The lower subplot will plot the mass's temperature over time as usual. <laughs> 
Now we get some really interesting results. Let's start with the upper subplot. In general, we provide some external heating up until some time, after which the heating stops. The shorter the duration of the heating, the stronger the magnitude of the heat we provide. Let's think about the physical interpretation of G of T. G of T is the external heat source. It has units of watts per meter cubed, so G of T is measuring the power per unit volume of the mass. If you recall from basic physics, 1 watt equals 1 joule per second. If you take the integral from 0 to 1500 of all three curves, you'll find that they have the exact same area. For instance, the area of the yellow curve is just the area of this rectangle here, which has height 4e5 and base 100, so the total area is 4e6. The units of the integral is watts per meter cubed times second. Since 1 watt equals 1 joule per second, the unit of the integral is joules per meter cubed, or the energy per unit volume. If we look at the red curve, the pulse is active for twice as long as the yellow curve, but the strength of the curve is half of the yellow curve, so it has the exact same area. The same goes for the blue curve. Anyways, the integrals all have the same value, and since the integral represents the energy per unit volume, it means we're supplying the exact same amount of energy to the mass in total. The only difference is how we distribute the energy. In the yellow curve, we distribute a lot of energy per unit volume, but only for a very short period of time. In the blue curve, we disperse a relatively low amount of energy per unit volume, but we distribute it over a longer time. Now let's turn to the lower subplot. For all three curves, the temperature rises up to some peak, then immediately begins decaying towards the steady state temperature. When the curves initially rise, they initially head towards the steady state value, which would be somewhere way up here if G of T were to have these values for the entire time duration. But when the pulse ends, G of T drops down to zero, so the steady state temperature actually just becomes T infinity. Therefore, the temperature drops immediately once the pulse is deactivated and heads towards T infinity. You've also experienced this in real life. When you put a cold pan on a hot stove, the pan immediately starts heating up. If you let the pan sit there forever, it would eventually stabilize to a very hot temperature. But let's say you take the pan off the stove after one minute. The second you take the pan off, its temperature starts dropping because you're no longer supplying the pan with external energy from the stove. That's exactly what's happening here. The temperature rises until we stop supplying it with energy, then it falls back down to the ambient temperature. This concludes the lumped thermal mass problem. To recap, we started by drawing the face portrait and anticipated solution, then performed three parameter studies to explore how the temperature of a lumped thermal mass behaves under the influence of different conditions. There's a chance you'll see a similar problem in your heat transfer class later on, so keep this one in the back of your mind. Heat transfer can be a pretty abstract topic, but we've all had plenty of personal experience with heat being transferred to or from ourselves, or from various objects. I hope my analogies like the pan on the stove helped you understand some of the physical interpretations of this problem. See you next time.